Welcome to another episode of Q&A with Pastor Andrew F. Carter. And as you guys know, I'm here answering questions, hard questions, questions that sometimes don't get addressed or talked about in the church. And many of these questions are coming from your guys' comments that you leave on these videos. So I appreciate your guys' willingness uh, to leave those comments and to ask these questions and then to trust me with uh, doing my best to share from my personal experience about how those topics uh, can be talked about here in the church. One of the questions that I have is how do you deal with temptation sexually mainly, whether it be with new people or people you've known prior? Now I've talked a lot about temptation I've talked a lot about sexual desire when it comes to relationship, but the Bible tells us to flee from sexual immorality, that when you're in a situation, whether it be a man or a woman, you're surrounded by somebody you know, you're surrounded by somebody, uh, or you're in a situation that is somewhat compromising, the Bible tells us to flee. It's not something that we uh, hope that we're strong enough to defeat or overcome. It's not something that we are putting our trust in ourselves, is we gotta beat feet and we gotta get out of the situation. Let's just say you're having a, a, a great workout session and right in front of you, a young lady pulls up to do straight leg deadlifts wearing a tight pair of yoga pants. Now, do I sit there and go, oh, I'm gonna hope that I don't look? No, our proclivity as human beings is typically to have a look, to have a gander. But what I would encourage somebody in that situation to do is to get up. Your workout just changed today, buddy. You might've been doing legs, it's time to go hit chest. Like you need to flee the situation and not rely on yourself to overcome that situation. Maybe you're in a relationship and you guys are struggling with keeping the, the, the relationship pure. Again, as a Christian, we believe that you should reserve intimacy for the boundaries and confines of marriage. If you're in a relationship, you're dating, you're filling each other out, it would probably be in your best interest to stay away from Netflix and chill. There's probably no reason for you guys to be cuddled up under the blanket, rubbing your feet together, watching provocative television shows. You are setting yourself up to fail. The Bible even says, uh, can a man bring hot coals into his lap and not be burned? Like you're quite literally playing with fire. So when you're in compromising situations, you have to flee and then know yourself, know what you have the proclivity to do. Know that if you look at something longer than you should, you head down a certain direction, whether it's pornography, whether it's, uh, you know, being in an inappropriate relationship, uh, being intimate with somebody like know your triggers, know the things that uh, lead you down those paths of making bad decisions and living in sin and then run, create boundaries, create guidelines. And when you find yourself creeping up close to some of those boundaries or guidelines, uh, get out of town, get out of Dodge, stop sitting around thinking you're going to overcome some of those situations. But I hope that helps. That's a great question. And uh, I would just encourage anybody and everybody who might be dealing with that to know that the power of Christ in you empowers you to overcome those situations. What does the word say? The word says to flee. Another question that was asked on a previous video, it says, uh, Pastor Andrew, how do you talk to your 12 year old son about his attitude in a positive way? It's very hurtful and concerning to me. I also have a 20 year old son living with me. How do you talk to them about boundaries and rules since technically he is an adult? When it comes to talking with kids, one thing and again, this is what's worked for me. I am in no way, shape or form uh, a, a parenting specialist. I am in no way, shape or form a family counselor. So what I share with you is derived from my own personal experience. And what I would share and what has worked for me in parenting and rearing my own children is being honest, open and transparent, like not hiding things, not weaving around the question. Uh, kids are smart. And I, I don't think that we give them credit uh, for how smart and, and educated they are. Uh, many times we think that we're protecting them by keeping them from certain things. But with my kids, there's no subject or topic that's you know off, off the table. Like we talk and communicate openly. They have the confidence to know that they can come and ask me about pornography. They can come and ask me about sex. They can ask me about drugs. They can ask me about anything without fear of me getting mad, of judging them, of shaming them, or, or making them feel less than because of what they're going through. And so anytime I'm talking to my kids, and I have kids in a similar age range. I'm, I have a 20-year-old, 18-year-old, 
and a 14 year old. They're all about that same age. Um, but I talk to them directly and then I don't beat around the bush. Honesty is everything. I think that it gives me more credit, uh, or it boosts my credentials with them when I'm just being honest, like, Hey, I know what you're going through because I've been there. I've experienced some of those things. And this is what I learned from these mistakes or these failures and not trying to protect them or, or sugarcoat things. I'm, I'm always just giving it to them raw. And sometimes it might be a little bitch. Sometimes they might be caught off guard or, or shocked. But what they do know is they have the confidence that they can come to me with whatever they're going through, knowing that they're going to get a truthful answer from their dad. Now, I understand that this is a question from a mother. A mother talking about her sons. I come from a single mother household, and um, I would say that it was probably one of the most difficult things for my mom to uh, raise me because I have questions that my mom can't answer. There's things that I'm asking about when it comes to growing up and being a man that she has no idea about. And so if you're a single mom in this situation, I would encourage you to use your community, your, your sphere of influence, the positive male role models who are in your life and reach out and see if they wouldn't lend some time or, or spend some time with your kids. There's a lot of programs uh, like the Big Brother program. There's a lot of uh, sports organizations where there's coaches uh, in churches. There's uh, usually men who are willing to have lunch, have breakfast, go shoot some hoops with a kid who can answer some of those questions or just be intentional about spending their time with them. And so for my single moms out there, first off, my hat's off to you. Not an easy job or, or a task to tackle, uh, but just know that there are men, safe men who aren't trying to exploit or touch your kids who want to help you uh, instill values and lead by example and show them what it is to be a positive male role model. Uh, this question come, it comes from our video where we talked about faith, family, uh, childbirth and dating. And first off, the question says, Kyra is so beautiful and funny and I'd have to agree. Uh, I, I, I think the same. Thank you for that comment. But the question is, you know, how do you understand the perspective about dating? I know that dating um, is somewhat not biblical. And that's like a question mark to me. I didn't know that. I'm kind of interested. I wish that you left a little more context in how dating is not biblical. Uh, but it says, how do you uh, approach someone with potential interest in 2024? Um, should you be friends first and then marriage, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you believe in Jesus or not, I definitely believe that a foundation of friendship should come first. Like you're jumping into a decision. You're making a choice about spending the rest of your life with another human being. If you guys aren't friends first, I, I don't know what to tell you. I can't tell you how many times our friendship was like the safety net to our relationship. Um, as partners. So, so not only are we friends, but we're also business owners together. We're parents together. We're church planters together. Uh, we have all of these different hats that we wear together. And sometimes when we're planting a church, we don't see eye to eye. Sometimes in our relationship, we might want to make moves or decisions where we don't see eye to eye. When it comes to parenting, although we're mostly, I would say 99.9% .9 .9 of the time on the same page, there might be a day or time where we don't see eye to eye. That friendship is our safety net. We come back to the fact that, hey, it's not you against me. We're friends. We're co-laborers. We're connected. We have a, a foundation of being friends first and everything else comes after that. And so I would encourage anybody who is dating or seeking a potential spouse or entering into a relationship is spend time. Don't rush through the friendship stage, especially in Christianity. Um, Christians, first off, they gets a little bit of attention from somebody, you know, somebody slides in their DMs and puts like a laughing emoji at one of their memes in the story. And they're just like, this person is sent from God. And it's like, well, pump your brakes. First off, like it's not that deep. Uh, you get a little attention, you know, shown to you. And all of a sudden you're making plans for uh, a wedding in some tropical destination. And it's like, you don't even know the person. Why don't you guys spend some time getting to know one another? Why don't you guys go out on some dates, go see a movie, go to dinner? Why don't you hang out with each other's friend groups? Why don't you get a better understanding of who this person is and how they deal with issues of life? Because issues are certain. You're going to have issues in your relationship. And I think that it would be helpful and healthy to spend time together and then see how 
they react to adversity. See how they react to grief. See how they react to obstacles. Is this somebody that you see yourself with long term for the rest of your life? Is this somebody that you have things in common with? Are you guys headed in the same direction? Do you have common goals? And most importantly, do you guys get along? Are you friends? So um, dating in 2024, I know, can be tough and challenging, especially with social media, especially with all of these dating apps, uh, especially with people not presenting who they are. Right? Largely, people are pretending to be something that they're not in order to garner the attention of others. And then once they get that attention, the masks drop and now they're completely opposite of who they presented themselves to be. Uh, I personally, as a married man, would not want to be single in 2024, especially with all the catfishing and all of the issues. So um, I would just encourage anybody who's in that dating season and looking for a potential partner or spouse, I would encourage you to find a friend first and go from there. All right, we've got a question that requires a trigger warning again. Uh, we had a video where somebody asked a little bit about masturbation, and I'm going to respond to a question that was garnered from that previous video. The question says, the responses seem to be geared to singles and those running to it, but what about married people that may do it together and or when they're apart, like one is out of town? Um, I, I believe that my stance on masturbation uh, stands for singles and married people alike. So if there was any confusion in that, um, mutual masturbation inside the bounds of marriage, inside your marriage bed is between you and your partner, right? As far as the marriage bed goes, do your thing. Let your freak flag fly, you know, whatever goes down in the bed is between you, your partner and God. I don't need to know what you like or the positions that you prefer that's between you and the lord however this whole masturbation while you guys are apart marriage again is coming together uh i still believe that masturbation solo the act of doing it by yourself is uh is is an act of being uh without self-control it's without being uh with self-control the bible tells us that we should be taking time from one another uh, when it comes to sexual relations inside the bounds of marriage. And that's to refresh the passion, to ignite that fire between husband and wife. I don't think that if your partner's out of town, you should be running to masturbate while they're gone. Because again, many times we can say, well, I'm not thinking about anything but them, or I'm thinking about our past experiences. Again, to me, that, uh, that lacks self-control. Also, it's I believe that it's pretty hard to, and no pun intended, but uh, I believe that it's pretty challenging to perform that act without flashes and imagery of maybe past experiences or things that you've looked at uh, when you shouldn't be. Uh, I just find that it's extremely challenging. Again, my personal conviction is that masturbation as a solo act is uh, a lack of self-control and therefore sinful. Um, that might not be the conviction of everybody, but I would encourage you to run to the word for clarification. And again, this is a subject that's not drawn out like thou shall not masturbate alone. It doesn't, it's not that simple. You've got to read between the lines, uh, seek God for guidance, and then come up with the conviction of the Holy Spirit on where you stand on that situation. So there's a great question. And uh, I hope that that clears some things up um, when it comes to that task. The last question that I want to talk about today here comes from the same video, but does not require a trigger warning. Uh, so no need to close your children's ears, but, uh, it says when going through spiritual warfare, is there ever a point where, you know, you turned the corner and headed in the right direction to overcome said spiritual warfare? Um, when it comes to spiritual warfare, I just want to say that there's an old saying, you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or you're heading into a storm. Um, spiritual warfare, I believe, is something that's constant. Uh, there, there's never really a, a time of reprieve or that you're not under attack. The enemy is waiting for an opportune time to come against you. That's why the Bible tells us to stay alert to stay prepared, to stay awake. It's constantly calling us higher and calling us to open our eyes and realize of the spiritual war that we're in. Now, uh, the intensity and the frequency of warfare may vary. 
There may be a time of peace or a time where there's very little warfare uh, in comparison to other times that are extremely intense. But I always look to the Lord, regardless of what I'm going through, my eyes are on him. No matter if I'm in a storm or I'm facing an obstacle or I'm facing some kind of an issue, my eyes are on him and I trust him. I trust that whatever's coming against me is many times trying to take my eyes off of what he's doing, right? The Bible says that the weapons will form, but they will not prosper. So because of my trust in Christ, my relationship with God, I know that there's going to be weapons. They're going to form. There's going to be distraction. There's going to be things that try to take my focus off what he's doing. But the enemy doesn't come against individuals who are uh, who, who, who aren't doing anything for the kingdom, right? Uh, there's an old saying that goes something to the effect like uh, a robber doesn't break into an empty house. And so if I wasn't on track and where I'm supposed to be, then the enemy wouldn't be worried about me because he's got me right where he wants me. It's confirmation when I'm engaging with spiritual warfare, it's confirmation that I'm heading in the right direction because the enemy's trying to stop. So I actually, when I see an increase of frequency and intensity, when it comes to the attacks of the enemy, I realize that I'm right on track. I'm right on course. I'm heading in the right direction. It actually confirms that where I'm going, the enemy's trying to stop me from getting there through whatever form of warfare or storm he's throwing my way. So that's a great question. I don't know if that necessarily answers it. Um, I don't know or can tell when the warfare is is necessarily changing it's not a black and white answer but if i pay attention to the spirit i pay attention to my word i stay anchored in truth i'll be able to navigate whatever life throws at me one of my favorite songs is uh it's praise him through the storm i think that one of the greatest postures and positions that we can take is a posture and position of praise it's really easy to, oh, God is good when the, the bills are being paid, right? It's, it's easy to praise God in your mountaintop moments, but it's really, really hard when you're going through hell. It's really, really hard when you're in the middle of the storm. But what I've realized is that God desires our praise. And if I would praise him on my mountaintops, but also at my low points, right? I feel like there is a comfort, a supernatural comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit and from my relationship with Christ. And so what I've gotten into the habit of doing is, hey, God is good, even if my circumstances aren't. Like God is good, even if what I'm going through isn't. God is good. His The nature and character of God is unchangeable. It's immutable. It is rock solid, and it is a firm foundation on which I can build my life. So I praise God through what I'm going through, whether that's worship music, whether that's prayer journaling, and I'm writing out praise, whether it's me even testifying to others and saying, hey, I'm going through hell, but you know what? God's good. Like I, I'm going through the hardest time in my life, but I'm going to praise God through it all. There's power in praise. And I don't think that many of us do a good enough job uh, of praising him through that. Usually in circumstances when it's tough, what do we do? I don't know if God hears me. I don't know if God loves me. I think he's forgotten about me. But the word says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. The word says that he is with you at all times, that he's fighting battles on your behalf that you don't even know about. And so because of the truth of the word of God, I won't fall for the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy want me to think that I've been forgotten about or that God doesn't care. And so by praising him, I'm making a stance and making up my mind and setting it in my heart. You know what? Regardless of what I go through, I'm going to praise God through the storm. And it shows God that, you know what? This, this little dude's serious about this relationship thing, right? He's re This little dude, I can trust him with much because he's going to praise me regardless. He's going to praise me if it's good or if it's bad. I can trust him with much because he's a good steward of little. So that's a great question. Thank you for watching another episode of Q&A with Pastor Andrew F. Carter, where I do my best to answer your guys' challenging questions from my personal experience. Do me a favor, before you go, make sure that you like this video, click the subscribe button and turn on your notifications. And if this video blessed you, do me a favor and share this with at least one person because sharing is caring. And what we talked about might just bless somebody with what it is that they're going through. So until next time, you guys leave your comments on this video so I know what to answer and we will see you guys next time.